Uh, the podcast is about religious satire. Yeah. So I just talk to comedians right. about this and that. Enjoy, and course, enjoy hell. <laughs> that's that's my goal. I want to get there as in the funnest way possible. Welcome to the Comical Heathen. This is your host, Dr. Jerry Jaffe, the world's most highly educated stand-up comedian. Uh, this is my podcast where I interview comedians about religious satire, and I share uh, what we talk about with you. It's all part of a project I'm working on. I'm writing a book about religious satire. It's been a hot minute since we had an episode that had a little bit of a hiatus for a couple months, so I appreciate your patience, and welcome back. Welcome back. Today's episode features my interview with television writer and producer Dan O'Shannon uh, from the Cleveland area, and I uh, had an opportunity to meet up with him, and I really appreciate his time and his uh, kindness. Before we get to Dan, let me just say, uh, regular listeners, people who listen to other episodes, know that I always talk about uh, my pet rabbits on the show. They're sort of the unofficial mascots. Right now, we have two Holland Lops, Kelvin and Newton. And it had been a few months since the last episode, so I just wanted you to know the two rabbits are getting along just fine. They've really bonded. They're our best friends. They spend a lot of time together. Uh, my wife refers to them as husbands. They are both uh, males, but rabbits are very social, and they groom each other, and they spend time together. Calvin, Newton, getting along just fine. I have a quick animal-related digression. This is just something that's happened to me recently, and I wanted to share with you. I uh, just recently had the experience of discovering that I had bats living in my attic. A little bit disturbing. We never really heard them. Uh, we had a service person up in my attic doing some work, and he noticed a lot of droppings. So we brought in some pest control. Um, had a, got a second opinion. Got a, people taking a look. And bats. Have you ever seen a horror movie that has scary bats in them? People always go, bats! Bats! Man, I hate bats! Now I know why people say bats like that. They can be cute, and they're very good to have in your neighborhood because they eat a lot of insects, especially mosquitoes. But they do a lot of damage to the house. Uh, the estimate for having the bats removed is over $5,000. Uh, use your insulation as a litter box, and so all your insulation has to be swapped out. Uh, they carry a lot of bugs, parasites, something called bat bugs. I never heard of that before. So there's a lot of spraying treatments have to be involved. And I thought it was going to be like a nightmare, and it hasn't been fun. But one thing I did not know, and it turns out a lot of people don't know this, is a lot of homeowner's insurance will cover bats. So I don't know what your homeowner's insurance says, so I, you have to check into that yourself. But uh, mine does cover bats. In fact, the insurance adjuster said most people don't realize that if you have bats living in your attic, your insurance probably covers it. It's because they do so much damage. So it's really the damage and repairs to the house that are being covered. So I uh, thought I'd pass that along. Not a lot of people know that. And also, uh, so that's what's going on in my life. Bats! Bats! Now, one of the aspects of uh, owning rabbits is that we have uh, cages, and we line the cages with newspapers, and kind of uh, unintentionally, ironically perhaps, owning rabbits has led to me reading newspapers again because we put the liners in the cage and you see the headlines and you know you notice headlines or maybe a few years ago I wasn't paying that much attention every once in a while I'll see a headline on some uh, religious or cultural pseudoscience topic and it'll catch my attention because there's something uh, disturbing or incorrect about it and here is a headline I saw recently tape surfaces purportedly with Southern Baptist leader Urging Abused Women to Pray, Avoid Divorce. This is by Michelle Bornstein of the Washington Post, dated April 29, 2018. The Southern Baptist leader in the headline is Paige Patterson. And, you know, I was wondering what kind of guy would tell some, a woman suffering domestic abuse to uh, choose prayer and to avoid divorce over other more proactive things. So I just did a little bit of research, and here's a, I read the article, did some follow-up research. Here's some things about Paige Patterson. Hey, uh, first of all, Paige Patterson, Paige Patterson, PP, doesn't that sound like the mild-mannered office worker, alter ego of a superhero or something? Peter Parker, Bruce Bannon, Paige Patterson. And over here, typing at an exceptional 182 words a minute, our new intern, Paige Patterson. 
Oh, no, wait. I gotta go. It's the douche signal. Yeah, Paige Patterson sounds like it should be the name of a second-rate professional wrestling manager. You know, Paige Patterson, we're going to settle this next weekend at the Armory in Mentor, Ohio. You know, the, of course, the crazy thing about that is I actually believe in wrestling more than I believe in God, because at least uh, professional wrestling I've seen with my own eyes. So that does make it a little more real. All right, and uh, he is a leader in the Southern Baptist movement, evangelical movement. Southern Baptists, Southern Baptists. Southern Baptists are a lot like regular Baptists but with a lot more Confederate flags, fewer shoes, and as biblical literalists, they have an acute awareness that there is literally nothing in the Bible against cousin loving. They can relate to that. You know, a Southern Baptist is just like, you know, your normal run-of-the-mill regular Baptist, except the ceremony takes place at the Talladega infield. And instead of just sprinkling your forehead with water, they get your T-shirt wet with Gatorade. You know, and the winner of that wet T-shirt contest first one to heaven. So this is what the article is actually about, an uh, audio tape surface from a few years ago, where Paige Patterson is talking about how he tells women in his congregation that if they come to him experiencing domestic abuse, they should pray, they should be submissive like the Bible teaches, and they should not seek a divorce. He was confronted by a woman with a black eye who then demanded of him, are you happy now? And his actual real life self-confessed no joke reply was yes. Yes, I am. Now, the reason he was being happy about it, apparently, is that it was touting the power of prayer. Because that abusive husband was in church later that week. That is the power of prayer. No burning bushes, no parting the Red Sea. A uh, Southern Baptist went to church. Now, if she had prayed for her husband to be mauled by a bear, and then her husband was actually mauled by a bear, then we'd have something. Then we'd be cooking with holy water. Having this Rocky wannabe show up in church might be answering somebody's prayers, Paige Patterson, but not hers. It is more for the minister, you know, since he can gather some extra tithes, you know. Paige Patterson's ideas about a marriage and divorce come from his interpretation of the Bible, which is weird because life has changed a lot in the thousands of years since people wrote it. You know, it's like a good thing that we don't rely on the Bible for traffic laws. Can you imagine that? Instead of a sign that says, Road Narrows, it'd say, You gave a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. Ponder how to interpret that as you drift into another lane. You know, the Bible calls a divorced woman who remarries an adulteress. That was thousands of years ago. Hell, nowadays, anybody who's only on their first divorce is basically still a virgin. These are evangelical women. You think they need to be told to pray? That's already their go-to move. They pray for good weather, soccer victories, and for the characters on the show. This is us. Prayer is the one thing we know they got down. Two women go to Paige Patterson with complaints of their husbands hitting them, and he went to the Bible and hit him with that. So Paige Patterson says abused women shouldn't divorce their abusers because divorce is against the Bible. Hey, I'm not taking marriage advice from the same book that says you can't wear clothing made from two different materials. I have enough trouble finding clothes that fit me in the first place. And anyway, did you know that evangelicals actually have a higher than average divorce rate than the rest of the country? But they also had a higher than average rate of voting for Trump. So maybe making good decisions just isn't their thing. Well, I found out, uh, you know, reading the story and doing research, that the tape in question actually originally came out in 2000. And in certain corners of the evangelical community and the Internet, the tape was out there and it was troubling to some you know, uh, Christians and some evangelical leaders. And, you know, that tape came out in 2000. And the Evangelical Council issued a statement. Uh, they adopted a policy, a formal statement, that said physical, sexual, or emotional abuse is a sin and a crime that must not be tolerated in the Christian community. So, you know, you got to give them some credit for um, being willing to, to change and respond uh, 18 years later, the recording came out in 2000, the change to policy came out three months ago, back in March. I mean, just even changing what is and isn't a sin is more proof that they're just making it up as they go along. I mean, this isn't fish on Friday. This is punchy, punchy, wife, wife. This change is actually largely seen as a response to the Me Too movement. So if you're keeping score, 
it was humanity that moved the needle on this one, not prayer as prescribed by the old men trying to hold on to their social status. By referring people in need, in genuine need and suffering and immediate help to their invisible super buddy in the sky. You know, one more twist to the story is that uh, after this story broke in uh, March and April of 2018, Paige Patterson was fired for telling women suffering under domestic abuse to pray. And now that he's unemployed, I wonder, is he praying for a new job? Or is he like doing something himself about it, like sending out resumes, checking job sites online, brushing up on his pole dancing skills. I'm sure there's a douche signal out there somewhere he can answer. And that is what I found at the bottom of the rabbit cage. I consider misinformation a sin. That's why I call it misinformation. And I just want to get accurate information out there. It's what I do. It's my calling, if you will. I'm not trying to ruin anyone's good time. But hey, you know, it might be your dogma, but it's my karma. All right, let's uh, get into our interview today. This is Dan O'Shannon. Dan O'Shannon's American television writer and producer. He's worked on numerous shows that you know, including New Heart, Cheers, and Frasier. He's executive producer of Modern Family, originally from Cleveland, the Euclid and Painesville areas. And uh, he's the winner of six Emmy Awards and five Writers Guilds of America Awards and numerous other nominations. And he's written two books. He wrote a book about comedy called What Are You Laughing At? And he's also written a, a, a cute little book called The Adventures of Mrs. Jesus. And it was this book, The Adventures of Mrs. Jesus, that got me, inspired me to reach out to Dan, see if he'd be interested in talking about it a little bit. And uh, in our interview, we talk about both his books, his writing career, about doing satire and uh, television sitcoms. We talk a bit about Frasier, including an episode of Frasier where the character of Frasier prays. And while we're talking about the book, I just want to say something here as well. This isn't a second rant. It's more of an observation. While Dan and I were talking, he brought up that in the comments section of Amazon for The Adventures of Mrs. Jesus, he got a lot of hate. You know, a lot of angry Christians did not appreciate. And on the one hand, like over 50% of his reviews for this book are one-star reviews. And I want to tell you, that is not, of course, accurate or fair. I went out and put on a five-star review because uh, I think this book is so cute and so funny. And even as far as religious satire goes, it's not really an attack on either Jesus or on religion. Um, you'll listen, Dan will tell you what the book's about in a minute, but it's almost as more about a satire on married life and on how Mrs. Jesus always needs to be the center of attention. And it's a graphic design, uh, almost like a cartoon book, almost in a Monty Python style-esque of using clippings and cutouts. And uh, you should read it. But I, I wanted to say, I looked at the um, customer comments, and this is the highest rated critical review. It got one, uh, this is um, Teresa, January 11th, 2016, Amazon review section, one out of five stars. And this is what Teresa had to say. How can this book get away with such derision of Christianity and Jesus in such an age of political correctness where seemingly everything is classified as hate? Such a double standard. If this book was about homosexuality, Islam, gender identity, or other protected classes of the day, it would be banned and burned and everyone would be scrambling for cover, apologizing for their insensitivity. But Jesus and all of Christianity is now open game for any hateful attack. Forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. So, Teresa, speaking of knowing not what they do, I don't even know how to respond to half of the babble in this comment. This is not even defending uh, my uh, good acquaintance and very funny man and very gracious gentleman, Dan O'Shannon. Just... Your comments are full of um, erroneous and gross generalizations. How can the book get away with the derision of Christianity and or Jesus? There's almost no Christianity in the book. There's a character called Mrs. Jesus. Um, double standards about derisive comments about homosexuality or Islam being protected. There's no protected classes. People say and do what they want. And if you offend then that is part of free speech as well. There's no protected classes. 
everything is classified as hate. Uh, I've seen a lot of Twitter, and there are definitely hateful comments on there, but everything, and it's insensitive. It's actually a very um, compassionate depiction of Jesus' sacrifice by putting a, a comedic spotlight on the wife's need for attention. And this comment, I don't know, Teresa, I, uh, she may well be a very sincere or good person, um, but the comments on the comment section reminded me of something. And I'm going to get this one little comparison off my chest, and we're going to get to my interview with Dan. I love Monty Python's The Life of Brian. I think Monty Python's Life of Brian might be the number one comedic satire on film. Uh, certainly a case can be made. And as you might know, that was going back a few years, I'm old enough to remember, that movie received bans, some places wouldn't show it, some countries wouldn't show it, religious leaders complained, and even quite famously, there was a one-hour television debate between John Cleese and Michael Palin and two religious leaders and the British uh, religious apologists. And Monty Python made it clear, definitively clear, that the movie Life of Brian is not about Jesus. In fact, the first scene of the movie, if you've seen it, is a manger scene where the three wise men come in, think Brian is, you know, the uh, prophesized uh, savior. They did do some comedic bits with Brian and the mother. And then they realize that Jesus is in the manger across the street. So they included that scene in order to make it clear that Brian is not Jesus. The next scene of the movie is Brian and his mother at the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is up on the Mount doing the sermon, and Brian is watching. And then they have jokes about how they're so far in the back, it's hard to hear what he's saying. In fact, the Pythoners, in their defense, in trying to explain what they, their project, they said that they don't think Jesus is a good topic for satire, because whether you think of him as a religious figure, a historical figure, or even a literary figure, he is trying to do good things. And he's trying to help the poor. He is with the weakest. And it's hard to make fun of a person like that. And it transpired in the debate that the two religious leaders had gone to a screening of the movie that day so they would know they had seen it and could talk about it fresh in their mind. But they had arrived late and missed the manger scene. So they're complaining about a movie that they did not properly watch. And that is the comparison. I don't know how many of these people with these one-star religious and criticisms of the Dan's book, read the book, read the book all the way through. The book actually has a rather touching and, and sentimental ending. So this kind of hypocrisy, uh, this knee-jerk, oh, it's making fun of Jesus, it must be this horrible book, uh, is just uh, you know out of whack, unfair, you know, even easier to make fun of than Paige Patterson. All right, I'm going to put a link to Dan's book in the description of this podcast, and I'm going to uh, put a link to a YouTube video of that Monty Python debate, in case you might be interested in that. So without further ado, let's turn our attention to my interview with Dan O'Shannon. Welcome to today's episode of The Comical Heathen. I am here recording live in the... Barnes and Nobles in Mentor. I want to thank the manager, Chad, for letting us use this space. And if there's a little bit of noise in the background, that's a good thing, because that means there's people inside a bookstore in the 21st century, mm -hmm. and we approve. I'm your host, Dr. Jerry Jaffe, but I'm excited today to be able to interview Dan O'Shannon. Dan O'Shannon is from the Cleveland area. He's a well-known television writer. He has uh, six Emmys for working on shows like Cheers, Frasier, and Modern Family, uh, as well as having written for other television shows. Many, many, many of them. Many, many, many of them. And let me just mention, you you have two books out. Yes, yes, yes. There's the book, The Adventures of Mrs. Jesus, yeah, which right, is right. what inspired me to invite you to the comical evening. <laughs> and you do have another book called What Are You Laughing At? Right. It's a little bit more of a academic or yeah, practical guy. It's, it's a ac academic, I'd say. It's all okay. about comedy theory. All right, so I might ask you a question about that, Anon. Okay. But before we get to um, your accolades and your writings and your opinions, blah, blah. how about The Adventures of Dan O'Shannon? Oh, oh nice. From <laughs> the Euclid, Painesville area? That's right, that's right. I grew up on the east side of Cleveland, in Euclid and then Painesville. Okay. And, uh, I grew up in the 1970s here and uh, well, graduated high school in 80. In 80? Painesville, Riverside. Go Beavers. <laughs> and how does a... Uh, 
young man in Painesville get interested in comedy? Well, I'd been interested in it since I was about eight years old. I had no aptitude for it when I was eight years old, but that's when I first became obsessed with it. And so I tried everything I could think of to be funny, and I watched funny things on television, funny movies, sitcoms, cartoons, Is I there Mad Magazine. that stands out that inspired you or that you just really thought was funny Do you know, uh, in those days? Kind of every old cartoons I loved. Sure. Um, I loved, uh, I, I think, kind of everything. I had a broad palette. So it's a Mad Magazine. I, I loved stuff like that. Sure. Um, and then uh, when I got to about, I guess around ninth grade, I discovered Robert Benchley, who was a humorist in the you know, 20s and 30s. And sure. That led me to Thurber and a bunch of people from back then. And then okay. I really kind of, I just ate all that up. And then I started okay. reading things about how comedy works. And okay. uh, that I just gobbled up as much of that as I could. And uh, eventually I started, because I was very not funny, but I was trying all the time. So sure. I was very obnoxious. So I, I had trouble making friends because I was always <laughs> trying to perform and yes. not doing it well. <laughs> so, uh, but around maybe 11th or 12th grade, I became what I would call reliably funny, where okay. I was hitting more than missing. And then I graduated high school in 1980. And I wanted, by that time, I knew I either wanted to do stand up or go right for TV was sure. the big dream. Remember, this was the days before the internet. Yes, so absolutely. if you didn't live in Los Angeles or New York, you couldn't find out how to get into TV. There was right. no guide here. Yeah, to there's tell not you. even a guide, let alone. Right. There were books about <laughs> writing comedy, but they were so old they were in the library, and it was like how to write for Duffy's Tavern, you know, in, the, <laughs> um, in radio. And so, um, so I would tell people here, like I went to Cleveland mm -hmm. State University briefly, and I said I want to write TV, and they said, well, that'd be great, yeah, but tell us how. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't tell you. So, uh, so I dropped out early on. Okay. I was not a good student anyway. Okay. And uh, I started doing stand up because I figured at least that way I could get some chops. Sure. You know, learn We're how doing to craft a joke. Cleveland? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Cle the Cleveland Comedy Club. Okay, what, in yeah, what were the venues in 81 in Cleveland? In 81, there where were, young there, men could try stand up. Uh, well, back then, in the early 80s, there, there was a huge comedy boom. So the sure. Cleveland Comedy Club started it off, and then a place opened up like. Uh, like in Columbus, another place opened up outside of Youngstown, and sure. another place in Youngstown, and then these little places just opened up everywhere. Everyone had a comedy night. Was, yes. Every bar had a comedy yes. night, open mic night, every tire store, you know, it's like, <laughs> or color tile, you know, Thursday's comedy. Like, what? But, uh, and so that was great because you know, Americans weren't sick of comedians at that time, sure. and so it gave us lots of time to practice our craft, you know, right. stage after stage after stage. And, uh, you know, I put together an act. I learned a lot about the, the craft of writing and, okay. and what performing actually is. Was there anyone in, the, in that scene in 81 in the comedy venues and clubs, an uh, older person or a chum who mentored you or helped you? Or I wouldn't say really there was because I think once they were getting older and good enough to mentor, they were off doing it professionally <laughs> because the, the open mic nights were really just for the ones sure. of us that were just really learning how to put jokes together. You know, did that enough, and then you graduated on to the next sure. level, which was doing it professionally. Okay. And I did that. And uh, Did you ever go out on the road? Oh, like yeah, yeah. Stand -up oh yeah, yeah, I did. I, I did. And I sort of went all over the place. I, I didn't go much farther west than, like, Tulsa or something. Sure. But, uh, That's west enough. Yeah, <laughs> I believe so. But I, like, never went to Los Angeles or anything. Okay. And then um, at the beginning of 84, in about May of 84, I was, I was making a lot of noises about going out to write for TV and learning how to sure. do that. And my parents were dead set against this. They hated that I dropped out to do stand-up. They, they thought I was terrifically untalented <laughs> when I was only mildly untalented. So they overestimated me. Yes. And, um, and finally, mm -hmm. I knew a guy who was going out there and said I could sleep on his couch. He okay. wasn't in show business, but he had a couch. And uh, I had 100 bucks in my pocket and a one-way ticket, and I left a note on the kitchen table. Really? And I went. My parents were furious. I'll bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations. Well, thanks very much. Taking thanks. the leap. Ah, thanks. Yes. I got very, very lucky. <laughs> okay. Uh, so just in terms of luck and your growing talent, how do you go from that? How did you start writing for television? What were your okay. first gigs or your first right. opportunities? And again, it's a different world now. So like when young people say, like, how did yes. you do it? I can tell them, but I feel like they have a whole different set of cards to be yes. dealt out to them. You know? For example, uh, what I learned eventually, I went out there, I did a little bit of stand-up, and I worked at a movie theater. If you ever saw Fast Times at Ridgemont High, sure. it was that movie theater. Oh, okay. Uh, in that mall. <laughs> and um, uh, it was very valley girl type time in the early and it was the mid 80s it was sure. a great time actually to be there and i did a little stand up and i met someone who knew someone who was writing for charles in charge oh, okay. sitcom. and through him i learned that you have to write a spec script you have to sure. basically pick a tv show that you like and write an episode of it right. and in script form i'd never seen a script so i took a bus to hollywood and it was a <laughs> store that sold uh produced scripts as souvenirs okay i spent five dollars and bought an episode of cheers okay and i studied it front to back and i borrowed a manual typewriter no computers sure, though, absolutely. at all Borrowed a manual typewriter on which the space key was not reliable. 
And so after every word, I'd manually advance a carriage. <laughs> and, uh, and because I wanted to get the margins right, I remember right. holding up script pages up against the window so the sun would come through, and I put typing paper over it and trace where the Which margins was, were right. so that I could get it to look like a professional yes. script. And I tapped out my first script. <laughs> The guy uh, from Charles in Charge was nice enough to read it. He gave me lots of notes on it. I went and redid it, and then I did a Cosby Show episode. And he mm -hmm. showed his boss, who hired me on a show called It's a Living, with right. about these waitresses that worked in a fancy uh, uh, restaurant. And that was the mid-'80s. That was my first job. Okay. And then I freelanced a little bit. And then I did New Heart, which was a big show. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, I did, and then I, I, I freelanced. And New Heart was the second New Heart That's show, right. the one at the inn. That's right. Okay. That's right. And I, I freelanced an episode then there and then the writer strike happened in 88 and there was a little bit of time off and then at that during that time I teamed up with a writer from Lake County called uh, Tom Anderson okay and he and I then went under the staff of New Hearts and wrote for a sure. season on that and then went to Cheers and then we split up as a team still very okay. good friends I know people okay. are concerned uh, <laughs> and um, you know from then on okay excellent what are you working on nowadays just anything with your interesting projects if you're allowed to talk about oh I, yeah I'm allowed to because I'm not doing anything I, uh, <laughs> I actually recently um, after five years of Modern Family I right. took a development deal at CBS and worked on some of their shows and I just got tired of it I, it's been 34 straight years of working sure. So I said to all the people in charge of me, agents and managers, accountants right. and whatever, I said, I'm taking some time off. And they okay. said, no, you're not. And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> and so I have a place, uh, a condo in Lakewood. Sure. And I rented out my place in Los Angeles, and I packed up the car, and right. I'm just out here now. Did you leave last... a note on the counter? <laughs> yeah, I should have. You know what? I think I actually did. Um, yeah, some instructions, you know, how to water the plants. And sure. <laughs> but, um, and so I've been out here for about two months. My guess is I'll stay for another three or four months, and okay. then we'll probably go back in the fall and find some work. Okay. I don't know if it'll be TV. Maybe I'll work at a theater. Maybe sure. there's an opening still at the movie theater. I can go back. Absolutely. I remember how to do all that stuff. Sure. Well, now that's all changed because it's run by computers now too. Oh, damn it! All I have no place in this and world. Apps and the <laughs> I'm a movie dinosaur. card and all of that stuff. Um, so you've written two books. Yeah. Uh, before we get to the satire, the Adventures of Mrs. Jesus. Right. Uh, I know it's been a few years since you wrote it. I don't want to put you on the spot. Okay. Can you tell us a nutshell version of what? Uh, what are you laughing at is about? Yeah, you know, uh, there are a lot of academic people who study comedy sure. and write books on it and articles Guilty. and that sort of thing. I often read them and I go, this doesn't, this doesn't work. Um, <laughs> or I'll say, this is right, but only so far. Like right. if someone says all comedy is disappointment, all comedy right. is whatever, all comedy is right. aggression, all comedy is right. insecurity, then you can always find 10 examples of something that doesn't really fit in that. Yes. You know, and so I, I was reading a bunch of them, and I just kept shaking my head. Because people were testing different senses of right. humor, but they were using different kinds of comedy to right. do it. And they, the, the reason they couldn't figure out, couldn't really get good answers right. on people's senses of humor is because no one could agree on what comedy was and how, how to test it. Sure. And then, then there are people that, like, they, they'll put a bunch of jokes in somebody and try to figure out what is the funniest joke. Well, that yes. won't tell you how comedy works. It'll only tell you what joke was the most popular and what most well-liked in that study. Yes. It was a yes. popularity contest for a joke, you know. It doesn't say about comedy. Mark. And so then I thought, well, one day I thought, well, instead of just, like, looking down on it, what, what would I say if someone said, okay, Smarty, what's uh, this yes. comedy? And I sat and I thought about it, and I thought this might be kind of a fun thing to try and never figure out, like yes. sort of like a perpetual motion or something, and yes. spend a few hours and give up. And I kind of started sketching out kind of that, that there's already all these factors in place before you come into contact with the information that makes you laugh. Right. And there's the information, and then there's all the stuff that that information triggers. Yes. And then all these different points of view from which you experience that information. And based on that one kind of sort of very, very sketchy diagram, right. I started asking myself questions one at a time at a time at a time. Right. And for eight years, right. I would challenge myself and say, okay, that works for all these kind right. of jokes, but then there's something that doesn't quite yes. work. What's the deal there? Is yeah. there an exception? I don't want to do a rule with an exception, but I, I, I fell prey for a little while to the... Uh, to the academic kind of like falling in love with an elegant theory yes. because it was an elegant theory but unfortunately sometimes the truth is not elegant the right. truth is just easy and sloppy and you go oh well you have to bow to an inelegant truth there, there's you know? a um, joke perhaps advisedly I use the word joke yeah, yeah. in academia uh -huh. that a uh, theory and practice are completely different in theory but not in practice oh wow <laughs> wow I like that wow I feel like it, it, that you know sort of little bit of snarkiness aside that's yeah. the trouble with trying to study comedy yeah, it's like the theory and the practice. Right. Well, never... well, that's because the people who yeah. do the theorizing don't right. practice it. And right. The people who practice it rarely do the theorizing. Right. But as I said earlier, see, this will all come around. No <laughs> accident. I had no aptitude for comedy right. at the age of eight. So I had to spend many, many of my formative years figuring it out. People right. who are naturally funny don't figure it out. Right. They just use their charisma. This if something doesn't work. They never do it again. If something works, they do more of that kind of thing. They don't right. think about it. So it's a natural yes. evolution. 
but I had to analyze and analyze and analyze it. And right. so, and then once I started doing comedy, uh, stand up, I was very analytical about that and what made it work. Yes. And then when I was writing all these TV shows, they had live audiences. So it was like a laboratory every yes. single week. Sure. So I did hundreds of thousands right. of jokes in front of tens of thousands, if not more, people uh, every single week. And then millions of people got the ones right. at home, but I can't use them because they're not in the room with me right. reacting to the stuff. <laughs> And so, uh, so I had an advantage over academics in that I had a, 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 a lab experience. Yes. That, uh, in fact, I had, a, I had breakfast with a guy, uh, maybe you've heard of him, Peter McGraw. The mm, uh, name's familiar, but I can't place it. Yeah, he had a theory about comedy, but it's really just like a one-line theory. Right. It's kind of like, it's a small, it's, it's not untrue, but it's most like an acorn. And he's sort yes. of peddling it like it's a full-grown oak. Yes. Um, and, uh, and we were talking, and he said, uh, he said, I find it interesting that we're both studying comedy. In it. And he said, it was his quote, right. and I'm studying it from the inside, you're studying it from the outside. And I, I looked at him and I was like, how did I get outside? I'm the yes. one that does it. Yes. Uh, you're the one that's outside. That, you're trying to get in. My instinct is that's backwards. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So backwards. And he was a bit offended, I think. I said that. But I was like, what the hell? What do I have to do to get inside? I'm in it. And I, I said, look, I can get your credentials right. in about three or four years of going right. to school and yes. working. I can get your credentials. You could get my credentials never. Right. <laughs> you know? And so there you go. Yes. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's my pure ego on that, I'm saying. Well, but, as, um, as someone who had to learn to be funny yeah. in the academic circles there's often a kind of um question shot our way from professionals as to whether or not comedy can be taught you can be opinion about well, that. yeah that's the thing is the question then is by comedy what do you mean in other right. words the theory like the way i wrote my right. book sort of all the theory and the sort of right. like the model i created yes. can be taught so that someone can understand it better and look at right. laughter differently and have a deeper understanding of what it is being taught in practicality is right. a different thing. Sure. And I think what you can do is you could probably make someone a little funnier than they were. Okay. Some people you can make a lot funnier than right. they were, and then there's some people that are just hopeless. Right. So really, it's it's at that point, it's about the individual. Sure. So yes, it can be taught in a practical sense. Right. It can be taught. The, the rate of effectiveness varies. Right. I would say. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So on this podcast, our... Uh our topic under examination is related to a book I am trying to write on religious satire since September 11th. Great. And your just experiences in, I think you just used the number 34 years of television writing. Yeah. One thinks of television writing as uh, not always edgy. So is there much room for satire in television writing? Um, yeah, I, there is. And there's also uh, now in the days of streaming entertainment, you sure. can do anything about anything. You can do some really stuff that we would have considered just impossible right. 10 years ago can be done at the drop of a hat now. Right. You know, so, so the networks and their model for how comedy works right. uh, and what they can and can't do is really uh, uh, becoming prehistoric. Sure. So uh, there is now room for that. So, that, you know, there are, you know, sit, you'll find sure. sitcoms about Jesus coming up, I'm sure, and stuff like that. I mean, it's oh, all yeah. going to... It's all gonna, it's just going to get crazier and crazier. Well, I'll say, um, uh, A, Frasier is a much beloved show in the Jaffe household. Well, and it is my that. father's number one favorite sitcom well, of all time. I'm happy to hear that. So we, uh, I've watched every episode, and he's probably watched every episode ten times minimum. Oh, wow, wow. Since you're so familiar with it, I'd just like to use it as an example. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, one of my father's favorite episodes is the three-part episode where Niles has heart surgery. Oh, I, that's mine. Uh, uh, that is to say well, that I... saw I, you were listed as one of the writers yeah, in that. Yeah. What happened with that was... Um, and I got screwed by the network on that. But, <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, uh, what happened was we had an episode we were working out, the writers. Uh, we were working out an episode where Niles uh, has a toothache. Okay. And, uh, but the dentist can find nothing wrong with his teeth. So either it's there's something wrong with the teeth or there's a 1 in 10,000 chance that it could be deferred heart pain. Sure. And something wrong with his heart. And then throughout the episode, all the he says, well, the odds against that happening. I mean, nothing right. happens when it's 10,000 to 1 or whatever yes. it is. And right. throughout the episode, all these impossible things start happening right. to him. You know, he picks the, the right card out of the deck out yes. of the blue, and he wins a <laughs> raffle. I mean, all these things happen. And each one makes him spin more and more out of control. Right. And the standard ending for that right. is he's perfectly fine, and he made a fool of himself. Right. And he maybe said things that were inappropriate, and now he has to take them back. Yes. That would be how it would usually go. And I was driving to work, and I thought, what if we... What if we make it that it really is heart pain? Right. And the advantage of that is that it makes the viewer go way back. And all the stuff that we were laughing at actually were omens. They, they right. did portend tragedy. Yes. And also it's like a sock to the gut yes. because sitcoms just didn't do that. Right. And so it's like, no, we have to get you to the hospital. And that was the end of the episode. Right. And then immediately I thought, well, then we do a hospital episode. Then we do when he comes home. We do three parts. Right. Do it during sweeps week. And I called up the network and I said, right. I said, here's the here's the three episodes I wanted. They loved it. Right. And I said, but here's the thing: during when we shoot, when we air the first episode, we need the audience to not know 
that at the end of the episode, he's got a real heart trouble. Right. Okay, because it'll ruin the entire right. episode. Yep. And the network said, okay, we won't, we won't, we won't spill that. Right. And a week before that first one aired, <laughs> they they did the slow, dramatic, sepia tone Celine Dion in right. the background singing, Niles Crane, you've known him for 10 years. Right. Now watch as he faces the greatest challenge of his life. Right. And it's like, you just gave it all away. Yes. And before it even aired, I was getting hammered by the critics for doing a very special episode. Right. You know, and uh, and we thought like the hospital episode, we were very proud of how that yeah. one went. Yes. You know, yes. you know but, uh, you know, you just get slammed no matter what you do, so you get used to that. On the one hand, it's not a, a, as you said yourself a few minutes ago. There's no universal rule of comedy that's always going to apply. Right. But I have noticed that often in really effective comedy, a rewatching has a second meaning. Yeah. Like there's when you know the ending, the, like yeah. the irony of it. Yeah, jokes yeah. change. Right, so right, right. Yeah. The meaning behind the jokes change exactly. the second time or the third time. On the other hand, I, I was looking at this episode because part three is one of the few times in Frasier that religion is mentioned. Is that when Frazier talks to God? Yeah, he like... On the elevator? I, I, I think, think it was on does. the elevator, I but he says, he does. like, he, what? If, if Niles pulls... He makes like a pact with God. Yeah, if Niles yeah. pulls through, You're right, right. I'll, I'll cherish all my time with him. Yeah, yeah. Well, we see and where then, that's of course, going. Yeah. he comes out of the hospital insufferable. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, well, my favorite tiny little moment in that <laughs> is when he starts to pray to God, and he says, God, this is Dr. Frazier Crane. And I just love <laughs> the hubris of putting doctor in front of, in front of God. While you're praying. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. This is Dr. Frazier Crane. I was going to impress God or something. It's not funny. Well, in terms of um, satire, if there is satire, that's sort of directed at him and his hubris. Yeah. It's not yeah. particularly no, religious I mean, we don't satire make, yeah. as much as his character. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, there's yeah. a, a long history, and this will go, we want to go right into the book, of comedy that is done where some mm -hmm. of the elements of the comedy are religious. Yes. And there will be this knee-jerk reaction yes. uh, from various knee-jerks out there. Right. Who, just because you <laughs> used a religious allegory or, or reference okay. point or whatever, it's automatically sacrilegious. Okay. There were years and years ago, back in the 70s, on uh, Saturday Night Live, they okay. did a sketch that was supposed to be uh, a, a play in an elementary school that took place on Christmas Eve night and the whole manger scene right. and this, man it kept going wrong because there were kids. Yeah. And there were people that were, like, offended and terrified within the right. network saying, we can't do this, right. we can't do this, because we're making fun of Jesus. No, we're not. We're making fun of these little second graders, right. you know, and showing sure. what goes wrong there. You know, so it, it's just the, the idea that it even gets used in comedy. You've right. already offended a certain amount. And then sure. depending on what you say, you'll offend a greater and greater amount. Right. Um, well, the focus of the book I'm writing is on whether or not our ways in which maybe comedy responded to or changed after September 11th. And... Frasier was in the middle of its run at that time, and it had a couple of mm -hmm. connections to September 11th. Yeah, yeah. I don't recall the show particularly ever having a September 11th episode or dealing no, no, with issues, no. No. but there was like coincidences and behind the scenes connections. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was a, um, there had been the first flight, I think it was uh, flight 10 from mm -hmm. Boston or whatever, uh, that crashed into the uh, World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. I think that was actually mentioned in an earlier episode of Frasier, coincidentally. So and so, I'll be on flight. T I'll be on Delta flight ten or whatever okay. flight it was. You know, American ten. I can't. Remember. Okay. And um, but also uh, one of our executive producers and creators of the show, David Angel, and his wife were on that flight. They right. were coming out for the Emmys. We've been nominated right. for an Emmy, and they were coming out from their home on the East Coast. Right. And they were on the first plane to crash. So it was just devastating well, all that's of a us. Shame. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So yeah. So I mean, and we, you know, we were never going to joke about it. But on yeah. network TV, you were not going to joke about that right. anyway. Right. Um, now some, I mean, late night shows. You know, Saturday Night Live had. A, it's comeback episode, and yeah. Tom Stewart had his comeback episode. But, right, right. And Friends had, like, their little board on the door where they would have September 11th messages. Oh. But they never talked yeah. about it as characters. Well, they had two more because their show was set in New York. Yeah. And it's impossible to not talk about that. Our show yes. was set in Seattle. Right. So it didn't ever have to come up. I will mention, too, um, that there had been a previous, like, before September 11th episode about Fraser Crane Day in Seattle. Right, right. Which is also September 11th. Oh, I didn't 1997. know that. 1997. Well, you know, I didn't know that. Crane Day. Isn't that funny? Well, that's I believe one. that's correct. I mean, if I'm I'll look fact that check up. that, and if it's not right, oh, I'll edit that part wow. out. Yes. Wow. Because the hundredth episode was. Yeah. Yeah. Like Fraser Crane Day in Seattle. Well, yeah, I remember. But wow, I didn't. I didn't realize it was September 11th. Okay. I'm going to bore you with one more Fraser Crane anecdote from my side, All and right. I'm going to ask you about right. the adventures of Mrs. Jesus. All right. Many years ago, maybe around 1999, 2000, I was in Seattle. Doesn't matter why. I went to the Seattle, the Needle. Yeah. Uh, and I was going up the elevator, and it was late at night, and I was the only one in the elevator except the little like tour guide that 
yeah. Pimply Face used to work there. So on the way up, he had a little spiel. Like, if you look east, you can see this. You can do this. And don't forget to look at this. And then he says, any questions? And I said, uh, well, where is Fraser Crane's window. apartment? Yes, yes, yes. And he replied, Los Angeles. He said, Fraser Crane's apartment is in Los Angeles. <laughs> it is indeed. And yes, I realized he, of course, must have heard that question every day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he did. <laughs> That's hilarious. Although he then did tell me, like, where it would be if that building really That's existed. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, it would have to be a building as big as the Needle, because it was, like, almost level with our yes. window. Yes. <laughs> All right, well, I haven't gotten that off my chest. Now, how about the adventures of Mrs. Jesus? Ah, so where did that idea come from? I was going through a divorce, and um, I felt like, um, I'm sure, I didn't connect it at the time, because sure. I think a lot of things I write, and then I look back, and I go, oh, I see how it's connected to my life. Right. And at the time, I would not have been able to right. see it, but I, th I think I felt I was being, like, hounded in divorce court, and sure. I had an ex-wife who was just, like, just, uh, I've been married sure. twice. The first one's the bad one. Okay. <laughs> but uh, she was, uh, she was just... No matter what I did, it was right. never enough. I always wanted more and more and more right. and more, either of my time or my, you know, or of money or yes, whatever. Sure. And uh, I just always wanted to take and take and take. And I think somewhere I mm. must have connected some dots somewhere. And I was sure. writing, I was drawing, doodling on a script. Right. And uh, I doodled <laughs> Jesus on the cross with a woman sure. standing at the base of the cross. And she says, are you even going to ask me about my day? And I wrote <laughs> The Adventures of Mrs. Jesus. And I think that there was a lot in me psychologically that was sure. going on. You know, I think I felt like that with... Like my, my parents, I think I felt misunderstood by them, sure. uh, and I, I think that's a big sort of the idea of, of people being so petty that they can't see right. the suffering of someone right in front of them. Uh, is and by the way, that's I love Lucy is what it is. Okay, she wants to be in the best. She wants attention. Her husband is famous. Right, that's what she wants. Sure. This is what Mrs. Jesus wants. <laughs> Only it's like taking that pettiness and that very human uh, right. uh, kind of drive to this crazy degree. And, uh, and so really that's what it is throughout, right. is, is her jealous that her husband is getting all this attention, even though the right. attention is killing him. Yes. And that's what it, and that's the thing, it's like when people say, oh, it's religion, you're making fun of Jesus. I actually, except for like maybe one or two little jokes, I don't think I make fun of religion at all in the whole book. Right. It is about human beings. Yes. And what they're like. Yes. And our foibles uh, the, yes. in, in the face of, of miracles. Yes. And so all these people who, if you look at the reviews on sure. Amazon, it's a treat, by the way. Okay. Oh, I'm going to go to hell 20 times over. <laughs> but all those people are missing the point entirely. Yes. But it's about how stupid we are when it comes to things that are religious. And they kind of prove right. it, I think, in those reviews. Right. Uh, I'll make sure to include a link to the book in the description of this podcast. It's awesome, by the way. It's very awesome. <laughs> yeah, Did I was you... going through a nervous breakdown, actually, when I wrote that. And right. so, yeah, I had been divorced. Uh, I was living in a little apartment, and mm -hmm. I was working all day on... TV show, and I would come home, and I was on antidepressants, and I was just mm. like flattened out, and I, and okay. rather than spiral and go off in my own head because I was full of misery and angst and sure. anxiety, depression, right. uh, I used making these cartoons because I, I didn't draw them. The ones in the book, if you look it up, sure, uh, they're they're made from pictures I took from the internet that were public domain, and I, I pasted them into okay. these cartoons and put little word balloons. Did you do that like a pictorial editing yourself? I or did, did it. You have a graphic artist working. With oh, you I or? did it originally. I don't know how to do Photoshop, so sure. I used a program called Pages, okay, uh, which allows you to do a minimal amount of moving <laughs> uh, uh, visuals around. So I did that, okay. that which is good because it took me a long time to do, and it ate up my evenings. Sure, and it was very slow, quiet, meditative kind of work. Sure. And then I would have these very silly results when I was done. And uh, also it taught me inadvertently how to be a little bit of a cinematographer. Sure. Because I had one character who was literally, because he was on a cross, right. twice the height of all the other characters. Right. So how do you keep fitting them all in the frames? And when do you go for a close-up? Or when do you pull back? And why go for a close-up if his face is the exact same image every single time? But sometimes yes. psychologically you need to do that. Yes. So I kind of learned a lot from doing that. But it was uh, it was very quiet work, and it helps pull me out of my own Just Just um, putting you on the spot. I can edit this out if it doesn't go anywhere. Can you yeah. give an example of one of the jokes from it that you are fond of or that illustrates what the book's about? Oh. I actually left my copy at home as I was gathering up my computer gear, so oh, I'm gosh. dumb. So um, if none well, comes to mind, we can... <laughs> There's some, you know, there's a little bit of me kind of in all the characters, and there's a character of the Holy Spirit, which appears in the sure. shape of a dove, Yes. Uh, and he falls in love with a pigeon, who is an actual pigeon, and the pigeon never says anybody, but says coo, and it yes. eats garbage and stuff, <laughs> but the Holy Spirit has projected onto this thing, you are, you, you know me like nobody else does, you have the yes. soul of the poet and everything, and, and he gets called on it, and you're just projecting, and that, that's me a lot, I will okay. meet somebody, and then I will put them on a pedestal, right. and I will think they're the greatest person in the whole wide world, and make a total fool of myself. Right. So, I mean, um, and I had done that in a relationship that ended up, like, destroying me. And uh, sure. so that got in the book. And and uh, I had done probably about 100 of these on Facebook. I started putting it on Facebook. Sure. And my mom unfriended me. 
uh, really? which is the second saddest thing after the fact that she had been my Facebook friend at all. <laughs> and then, uh, but she unfriended me. She, she first she wrote some public things about how horrible it was. So I dedicated the book to her when it came okay. out. Okay. Now she loves it. Um, <laughs> but um, Harper Collins said to me, "We'll make it a book if you give us fifty more that haven't been on the internet." Okay. And so it allowed me to sort of close out the story. As sure. It the entire thing takes place between three hours of the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. Okay. And so there's no none that take place at night. We mm-hmm. refer to stories happening over days. Sure. It's all you know, self-contained. And uh, it comes to an ending that I think is surprising and hopefully a little bit emotional. Right. I was interested to hear your description of how you generated the graphic images just because, having read it, the simplicity of it mm-hmm. does bring to mind a kind of uh, Terry Gilliam, Monty Python-esque yeah, It's style. easier to cut and paste than to draw. <laughs> and by the way, I, I do have to give proper credit. A guy named Don, Don Bitters mm-hmm. went through it when the publisher said we we're going to do this at HarperCollins. Okay. They said, but we need higher resolution images than I had done. Okay. So he went through the whole thing, and he right. tweaked here and fixed that and made everything better. So if it's all bright and shiny and wonderful, it's because they, they look exactly like the images I came up with. Right. And he just sort of made them better. <laughs> and, higher quality uh, versions. Yes, yes. exactly. So okay. I, I couldn't have done without him. So okay. thanks, Don Bitters. Well, thanks, Don. We'll, we'll uh, stumble towards an ending. All right. Well, let me just ask a couple of questions. That's what we're all doing, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you just summed up the existential <laughs> condition in one clumsy phrase <laughs> as a you know comedy professional and connoisseur do you have any sense um, none at all <laughs> clearly of um any uh shift in comedy or stand-up comedy after september 11th yeah i'm sure but here's the thing it's like uh to look at 9-11 as the turning point i, th- I think there's something else that was going on too and that's the the internet i mean there, yes. had, there had always been gallows humor and there had been humor that jokes that were sort of quietly told among friends sure. after the titanic went down right. you know, it's like that there was a guy named ed gein who was a serial killer right. like he was the inspiration for norman bates and say yes and he would chop, he would dig up graves and chop, or he killed a couple of women, and he would take off their body parts and right. like keep them and stuff like that. And shortly after the gruesome discoveries happened, he was taken away. In that town, what was happening that had been gripped with all this fear, right. they were making jokes about it quietly. They were okay. saying, "What did Ed Gein give to his girlfriend for right. for for uh, Valentine's Day? A box of farmer's fannies right. and you know, stuff like that." And so, but the thing, the idea of putting those jokes more in the mainstream, right? And the, the more of, like, doing them as quickly as you could to sort of right. be the king of shock value, right. you know, and show how tough you are, when actually I think sometimes right. it's just how weak you are. Um, sure. That's been, that's the the goal to be there first has sometimes sure. trumped the goal to right. have good taste. Well, there was I, definitely September 11th humor on yeah. September 11th on the Internet. Oh, I'm on sure. On the same day it was happening, there yes. were people. Yeah, and that will, and the thing yeah. is, but now we're aware of it as a yeah. society. Yes. Whereas before these jokes were whispered, and we, yes. there's, we have a different image of ourselves and our friends right. and of society, this kind right. of invisible thing that's around us. And we will put up with all kinds of little things between right. us and our friends. Someone makes a really racist joke, yes. we'll all laugh at it, we don't judge. Yeah. But if, God forbid, someone told a joke like that on TV, the fact that society is right. hearing this, oh my God. Sure. And so, yes, you could whisper all these little jokes and say this, and, oh my God, that's cool. I remember when Challenger went right. down, there was, there was a, or Natalie yeah. Wood drives, yes. jokes like the next day. Yes. But they were jokes about college kids and whatever, and you would right. do the jokes and move on. And you knew that they weren't right to do. But the idea that they were being done now in front of audiences and, right. and on the Internet and everything, it's like, I think without the Internet, right. I think we would still be in the days of the jokes being kind of whispered, and we'd be a sure. little more uh, responsible as yeah. far as what goes into, the, into society. Sure. So I think a bunch of things were happening kind of once that got us there. The Internet has... has allowed us to, to engage in our more crass side yes. publicly. If you read any comments section anywhere, yes. no one's afraid of what they say anymore anyway. Yes. And so really it is this, this kind of exploration of our own society's id right. that is being worked out on every screen in America and the world. Well, I know one of um, George Carlin's collected writings is called Brain Droppings. Right. And when it's George Carlin and his like lifelong craft of comedy writing, yeah. Brain Droppings means one thing. But it's it kind of, in my mind, is also the perfect phrase for Facebook yeah. and Twitter. Yeah, yeah. You think something, you write it, you yeah. almost forget it immediately, most yeah, people. Yeah. So it turns thinking oh, into I just I a... It's so horrible. It's a, we've, we've all decided we have things right. to say. Everyone wants to write. No one has anything to say, it seems like. Well, let me just one or two kind of sum up type question. Sure. Just in the realm of uh, religious satire, I mentioned George Carlin. Are there any comedians in the past or currently that you think handle the topic well? Like, like that's a smart joke, or that's a smart writer, or. Um, well, I remember, like back in the, well, I remember back in the late seventies, early eighties, right. reading uh, National Lampoon. Sure. Where it's like 
Mad Magazine, but more grown up. Yeah. And so it was not <laughs> uncommon for a God joke to be there, or a whole piece about yes. me meeting Jesus or, or whatever. Yeah. And so I, I think that thing's been around. It's just the audience is getting broader and broader right. for it. As far as like, uh, you know, I, I know I'll think of ten of these in the car. Of course, time, but uh, I know that it's it's been there for years. Yes. And when you would find it, it was always sure. always delightful. And I remember when I was younger, because it wasn't so out there all the time. Right. Because, because we lived in a world where everyone wasn't twenty four hours a day making jokes about every topic right. there is to stumble on a magazine that did sure. a piece about you know Jesus or this. Or, and I remember back then a right. lot a lot of times like in the sixties and seventies. A lot of the, the religious stuff was right. limited to sketches about Peter at the heavenly gates. Yeah, so I guess it was sure. most, the least offensive possible kind of thing. Right. But but as I got older and I read older stuff and it was more kind of interesting right. and, and edgy, it was always kind of a secret delight to find those things. And like, Tihi, I can't believe they're talking about well, Jesus. I think there was something uh, which you mentioned as well, which was the comedy scene in the early 80s was without cable TV, without the internet. Yeah, yeah. So if you stumbled into a comedy club, yeah. and even if the comedian was saying anything edgy or satirical yeah. or political, it was just sort of there. Yeah. It didn't get uh, It didn't get out into society where we, no yeah, we have a different video Videoing culture. you with your phone. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, but uh, yeah, I, do, I remember as a kid, I would occasionally make religious type jokes. Well, I, <laughs> I remember once... Yeah, yeah, I was like a teenager. I was talking, I did an impression of a disgruntled apostle at the Last Supper. I, saying, I just had body and blood for lunch. And, you know, and so my mom getting furious with me about that kind of thing. Uh, no, I said that maybe, you know, how like, uh, what was it, uh, King Solomon? He was the one who said those, the women were arguing over the baby. He said, chop the baby in half. And the right. one who loved the baby said, no, right. no, give it to her. That's how he knew. Right. And my hypothesis with it was that, that his answer for everything was chop it in half. <laughs> and just that day he got lucky and the guy from the Bible was there and got the story yeah. done. <laughs> but I would, I, would, I would take apart those stories. Sure. Yeah. All, and, um, oh, by the way, and early before that, you had Bill Cosby doing his whole thing about Noah and the Ark. Yep. Yes. And then we all read that. We all listened to that yes. back then. Yep. Um, and so, so people had been carefully approaching that and taking it apart right. in a way that audiences could be okay with. And as sophistication grew and as technology changed, right. you know, people were just going to push and push and push. Well, Dan, that sounds like a nice note to end on. I'll take it. I'll take it, too. Well, let me just remains for me, your host, to thank you, Dan O'Shannon, for thank joining you. me for a few minutes. Thanks for having me here at Barnes & Noble. Yes. Thanks, Chad. <laughs> And that, my friends, was my interview with Dan O'Shannon. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I was very glad to meet Dan. I've met Dan a couple times over the years. Our mutual friend, the well-known comedian Mike Polk, introduced us once. And in fact, Mike and Dan were on an episode of my other podcast, Gold Star Classroom. So I'm going to include that in the links in the description of this podcast. So Dan O'Shannon and Mike Polk fans can look him up. Anyway, I really enjoyed talking to Dan. I enjoyed his insights into TV writing, uh, some of his stories about Frasier, uh, some of those goofy and, and tragic you know, coincidences with uh, September 11th. A, a sad element to that story, of course. I appreciated Dan's thoughts about just expanding technology and platforms creates more voices. So in my interpretation, even if religious satire is like a niche genre of comedy, there's more outlets for that. And uh, in particular, we were talking about his book, The Adventures of Mrs. Jesus. Of course, I like to hear the background, the personal stories, which were also very serious, but how they reflected through the lens of the creation of The Adventure of Mrs. Jesus. Of course, as I noted earlier before the interview, I was not surprised to hear about the reactions he got in the comment section of Amazon. Really, you know, that's people's opinion, so whether it's fair or unfair, I guess, is up in the air for each person to determine. You know, check out the book, and if you enjoyed it, go on Amazon and make some comments. Let's balance out some of the uh, knee-jerk negative Nellies from um, the overly religious readers. Hey, remember to look up The Comical Heathen. We're on iTunes and Stitcher and Podbean. Like us, rate us, leave comments, look up past episodes. We really appreciate you spending time with our podcast. I'd like to throw out some thanks. Uh, I already mentioned Mike Polk. I also want to thank Chris Lambert, a writer, actor, uh, man about town in Cleveland area, often seen at cons, selling his books and wares and performing his one-man Orson Welles show. Chris helped set up my interview with Dan, so thank you, Chris. I would like to thank Calvin and Newton, the unofficial mascots of the Comical Heathen. I'd like to thank my friend Jeff Geddert for writing and technical assistance that he provides for our podcast. Uh, thanks again to Dan, and thank you for listening. I would like to thank one more person. I never want to forget to thank 
my good friend Mark Bell, who is playing the famous Skinner organ, creating the beautiful interpretations of Bach music that accompany this podcast. So thank you, Mark. I'm your host, Dr. Jerry Jaffe. Thank you. Tell all of your listeners to go out and get the adventures of Mrs. Jesus.